Um, today, or this evening I should say, will be uh, the first in a series of discussions with individuals uh, about their work to try to uh, sort of tease out of them a, fr a few of the critical issues uh, that they are working on and to establish their presence in the larger architectural uh, community. Uh, tonight, it's with Wes Jones that we will be speaking. Uh, I should say we because toward the end we should have questions. Um, and I'm really so pleased it could be with Wes that this series would begin. Um, after all, Wes is someone who is extremely, has been very informative in the school's culture. And I, I want to just begin with a few observations um, and to enter into a critique, uh, to hit him on some issues that uh, I might have some disagreements with him about, to pull from him his thinking, and then to go a little bit further into some of his individual projects. Um, just to say a few things, and, and then this, this critique will unfold. Wes, what I think is important, uh, uh, one of the important elements in Wes's work, I think, is that it provides us with a means to reflect on the quotidian contemporary built environment that we are in, uh, in relation to its 20th century architectural sources in a very particular, very didactic way. Now, this provision is, essential, is an essential operative of modern architecture in general, and one which he has contributed to in an enormous, uh, enormously adventurous and original way. And yet, and yet, uh, Wes, it seems to me that your work is considered by many, and in some ways by me, many in the architectural world to be burdened with nostalgia. A nostalgia for a past condition in architecture, one in which uh, such distinctions as the high and the low architecture with a capital A versus the vernacular, these sorts of distinctions uh, persist. It is seen, I believe, in a way, in its focus, to be a kind of lament for a moment when commercial industrial construction reflected a functionalist ethos, uh, a condition in which form correlated directly with function. Now, Wes, he's called this, in a conversation with me, a kind of middle tech. And most of you know his work well, and you might be able to understand what that term means in relation to it. Uh, now, by adopting this kind of uh, tech or this kind of what I call machinist uh, style in his work, I think he has brilliantly avoided a central conundrum of modern architecture, uh, modern and contemporary architecture, uh, that is the arbitrary relationship between material and form that so many architects have had to contend with. He has done this. Uh, in a certain way, with a certain degree of acrobatics. Uh, he has, let's say, created the perception of a super legible tectonic condition uh, involving the mechanical movement of things whereby we can identify with the function of things very directly. And I should point out that he has done this, I think, and has avoided this conundrum by pulling himself out of the conventions of ordinary architecture and putting himself in the midst of this kind of world of industrial production or infrastructural kind of construction. Um, now, okay, this uh, condition, uh, I, I want to observe and make a comparison to a few, few things. This is all kind of an introduction, Wes, so don't worry yet. Uh, <laughs> this uh, whole way in which he brackets his work in, in this world of the industrial, as I said, it gets out of this dualism, uh, this dualism of material and uh, form. If, if on the one hand, uh, well, if we could say that one of the tasks of architecture is to somehow extract, uh, radically extract at its best, certain familiar conditions and transform them into, let's say, other things, things uh, other than familiar things that make us experience the world in a way all, that is not, let's say, in, in just in some kind of continuity with everyday objects. We could say that he is part of, let's say, a number of architects' projects. Let's go with uh, the two that I'm kind of saying he avoids. 
let's say he avoids the kind of extreme problem of the arbitrariness which we encounter in Gary, where the form and the material relation is, is really quite unresolved in many, many of the works. And he avoids the extreme the sort of immersion in material itself, as we see or have seen in some projects of Herzog and de Moron. There we see, for example, in Gary, the figural and, and in uh, Herzog and de Moron, a kind of conceptual artistic practice. So he, he gets out of the conundrum but does not enter into the kind of artistic practices. Um, he works himself back into the functional, functional uh, trajectory of modern architecture. Um, now, this, tech, this kind of embrace of technophilia and machinism, though, uh, I think because it is so relentless and so consistently applied in his work, comes with a toll. Uh, first of all, it is now happening in, uh, let's say, a kind of gritty, abject world of fallen, uh, it's a kind of fallen and disenchanted modernity. No longer is this kind of functionalism new or fresh. Uh, he keeps, he continues it nonetheless. He proceeds with his departure from architectural form, moves still into the industrial production, shipping containers, manufacturing devices, makes architecture all of, out of all of that to keep alive functionalism in a way. This dream of a reconciliation, as I said, between form and material. Now, he has said to me that one of the tasks, and I think I said it already, and I'm, forgive me for the redundancy of architecture, is to place us in our world. And I would say he does that with this kind of technical language, the guideways, the roller assemblies, the lift gates, the tracks, all these mechanical devices. Uh, real or symbolic, unmistakably symbolic. Now, first I would like to say, I'd like to just say, well, I think you might agree with some of the characterizations that I have offered. I don't know, but maybe you will or will not. And if you do agree, I would like you to explain this incipient nostalgia for modernism and to tell me whether you think it is something like, uh, would you characterize it as a kind of lament for the possibility of functionalism and its promise? A critique of the image-based consumer world of architecture of this time? or a refutation of the contemporary neo-avant-garde digital model of architectural production? W what is this relentless pursuit about? Well, first I would uh, take slight exception to an, a sense of architecture which places time and timeliness so um, uh, centrally in its value system that we can talk about nostalgia in relationship to it. Uh, it seems to me that um, architecture knows nothing of that sense of time. Uh, the uh, assumed privileging of the new and novelty, currency, et cetera, et cetera, that causes uh, a a reference, uh, let's say, to certain um, projects which may or may not be in the past to have a directionality that that uh, that begins to uh, acquire a sense of value, a negative value in this case. Obviously, nostalgia is not seen as a positive thing. Um, all that seems to me, at least in my understanding of architecture, to be foreign to architecture's uh, interests. Um, uh, we, we don't measure the goodness of a project um, based only on its currentness or currency. It's like saying, is Villa Capra not as good a building as Farnsworth House, for example? Uh, that is, within architecture, kind of a meaningless question. Um, but that's the uh, underlying assumption behind uh, charges of nostalgia in relation to work like this. Rather, I'd like to imagine that uh, the, the temporal dimension is broader and, and, and uh, wider than that, uh, deeper than that, let's say, would be the more appropriate metaphor, I guess. Uh, and uh, that to the extent that, you know, you're interested in architecture from a disciplinary perspective, which is, is very much what uh, my interest has been, um, you can range freely over all of the examples uh, through time. Now, uh, Having said that, you know, the, the other dimension of architecture is that 
it, it is expected these days to have some relationship to its times. It's supposed to place us in the world and, and therefore place us in our world, not you know, some past world or whatever. Um, so the presumption then would, would have to be that uh, I'm assuming that the imagery that you're finding nostalgic is not actually um, obsolete or uh, uh, out of date. Not the imagery. It's the it's the it's the compulsion, the desire to return to a certain condition in in modern architecture. Okay, uh, it isn't the imagery. Right. I guess the the issue, I have some difficulty with the idea of return because while it's objectively true that modernism sort of faded from the scene or was uh, beaten back by the Histo Pomo period um, in at least the modernism that I've been interested in. Although I would submit that we're all still modern. There is a kind of we inhabit an oceanic modernism still, uh, and that uh, which absorbs all and has absorbed so far all new uh, interests, including the digital and and you know the most extreme versions of PCAD. Ultimately, in my opinion, remains. Can you explain what uh, PCAD is? Uh, modern. Yeah, uh, uh, PCAD is a term that I uh, coined in order to. Uh, uh, gather together the uh, the most um, influential digital trends now, and it stands for post-critical authorless design or parametrically controlled, controlled automatic design, or you know, or any any variation between those two you you choose. Um, and so instead of instead of saying the blob, I was accused of being the coiner of the phrase uh, of the term blobmeister, which freaked me out so much that I figured I should use a different word. Okay, but, but, but Wes, I, still, I want to ask you, you could, somebody could still ask you, you, you haven't addressed for me the key question here, you know, why this? You know, it could, why this and not something else? Why this the techno, technical. whatever you want to call it, this machinist uh, style material? Well, if we understand... Uh, uh, I think of the 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 architecture that we, that that we do as having more or less been invented from scratch, recognizing that there is no received tradition, despite my earlier statement about modernism. Um, and so, if we want to build up an architecture from scratch, let's say uh, we start by asking, you know, what's the point? What does architecture do? What is architecture? How is architecture more than as it's conventionally understood in its relationship to building? How is it more than that? Uh, and so I, I, I very quickly come to the idea that architecture's role is to place us in the world. To um, It has uh, traditionally been the uh, uh, form in which a society embodied its highest ideals and aspirations. Uh, and so if, if that's, in, in a general sense, what architecture is supposed to be about, we, we then have to ask ourselves, okay, what world is it that it's going to uh, – that it's going to capture for us and and put into form in that way, and so what that but what that means is not simply a, a matter of what is the imagery present now, but really it's more of an epistemological question for us. How is it that we know the world? How is it that the world comes to us or is is understood by us? And from that very most fundamental uh, and basic uh, uh, perspective, uh, it seems to me that. Uh, the world uh, comes to us because of the, our own existence within it as meat objects in space. Uh, it comes to us mechanically. That our common sense, uh, the way that we experience the world and the common sense that we use as we interact with it is the product of two million years of evolution as physical bodies in space. And now, you know, I'm totally not into uh, the body and architecture or any of this kind of thing. But it seems to me that the most uh, straightforward and direct expression of that in our contemporary world is through technology. And there's a long you know, story that goes along with that. But technology is the way that we view the world nowadays. The world comes to us through the lens of technology. Okay, but can I? For a moment, yes. But let, let me just compare to two other architects who deal with technology. You, you know, you've written about, especially one of them, Corbusier, and the other I want to mention is Venturi. I recently, just the other day, had a conversation with Michael Meredith, and we both agree that you 
were important because you had done with the language that you work with what Venturi had done, let's say, to a kind of wider uh, and more vague vernacular that belongs to the kind of American landscape. You had transformed that in a way. Uh, well, the question I have for you about this technology, I mean, you look at it, it doesn't seem to me to be such a kind of urgent question. It seems rather marginal to architectural production. Take, for example, Corbusier's preoccupation with con uh, technology of construction. He meant to apply it very widely and even to a new model of urbanization, uh, but certainly to a new model of, of living, a new model of construction. Uh, everything about the world would be reshaped by this model. And then you take Venturi, and he is looking at a real, in a world, a kind of world in which we could see the, the demise of architecture according to certain kinds of practices and to methods of construction and certain all kinds of questions in the market. And we could see it bearing on the whole of the landscape. And he was looking at that landscape at large. Here you have isolated this very particular area that belongs, by the way, not to architecture, but to industrial production. You know, you're dealing with crates for moving things. We're not building, dealing with building types. You're, you're dealing with the stuff that we find when we're in warehouses and moving boxes around. This is not in the same vein of an investigation which has a wide application. And what's really interesting about that is you know, your whole interest is that it would have a wide reach, that your work partakes in a broader problematic of architecture, that it, it's a thesis of architecture. So, but in the end, because of, its marginal, because of its marginal relation to architecture, it's very private. See, I don't see it as marginal. I see it as even more fundamental than, since you brought him up, uh, Venturi. Uh, I think uh, uh, that, again, the, the point is, is that technology is inescapable. I mean, it should be pointed out, of course, architecture is itself unavoidably a product of technology. Yeah. So at the most fundamental level, we're, all we're doing is asking architecture to uh, take that cue from its own existence and production, which doesn't necessarily mean that we are highlighting building technology, but really to say that architecture is one of those things that we make, we bring into the world. I mean, starting from that fundamental sense that there are, there are basically two things in the world. There's nature, of which we are a, a part, and then there's all the stuff that we make that we bring into the world. So half of the world's stuff is technology, at least at, you know, in, in understanding yeah. it that way. And, and as, I, as uh -huh. I said earlier, we can't understand the one except through the other nowadays. We can't see the world except through technology. So technology is for us so fundamental. I mean, for me, anything that humans make, think, Anything that didn't exist naturally is a product of technology, including, I would submit, at the most fundamental level, mm -hmm. consciousness itself, which, uh, you know, in a long digression, I would just say is could be understood to be a product of technology rather than the other way around. So I'm, I'm trying to understand technology at the sort of fundamental level that makes language an aspect of technology, uh, uh, ideas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so... Having, if, if we accept that premise then uh, and, and we say that architecture is supposed to somehow capture this, mm -hmm. re, this reality, mm -hmm. then, uh, then the next question for us is what, what uh, aspect of technology, what technology is most apparent or visible to us? What is, what, and, and beyond that, what technology is most usefully visible to us? Now, that doesn't mean useful in itself, but usefully visible to us. What technology promotes the greatest amount of legibility in the interests of in, uh, uh, creating a deeper engagement with the ultimate social interest of increasing empowerment? If we want to make an architectural experience that is most engaging, yeah. um, if we want to turn the passive contemplative viewer into a user, again, mm -hmm. which is already to go down the road to functionalism like you were going – uh, uh, where you were going earlier, um, then it seems to me that the, the sort of technology that we are um, expressing, that we are referencing, let's say, in our work, and frankly that we are using, because it's not, it's not merely decoration, it's all doing something, mm -hmm. um, would be the middle tech kind of stuff that we've talked about, not low tech stuff. We're not, I mean, in a way you could say Venturi is kind of a, a low tech interest because he's, his interest is in the sort of cultural baggage, the 
the, you know, the de detritus, you know, the, all the, the lowbrow stuff that he wanted, you know, for various, um, you know, but on the other hand, it's a very contemporary practice, for example, in the way in which he collaborates with the, you know, the outfitters of the interiors. I mean, he's very much part of a contemporary mode of practice that maybe you're not in, a fun, in another. I mean, that's different. That I mean, that's a different question of contemporaneity, I understand. But you're talking right. about the references the work makes rather right. than the way it's practiced. Right, right. But anyway, continue. But, no, but, but I still, I don't understand here, but what is implicit in what you're saying is there isn't any technology in architecture that will do what you need to do, or the, what architecture needs to do. And in fact, it has to issue from uh, some other world, and in your case, industrial production. Uh, I mean, do you, do you believe that stuff to be architecture? I mean, that would be another question. What is that stuff? I mean, I couldn't even come up with a name for it today. Uh, you know, it's not industrial design. It's not. What is the stuff that we find in uh, the Home Depot to move our things around? What is the stuff that we move, uh, sorry, that uh, you, the lift gate, what is a lift gate? Is it industrial? What is that? It's not architecture. What's a lift gate? Well, it is what not category? architecture any more than a chair is architecture. Okay. So the question is, why do you, you have made this differentiation between things in and out of architecture. You have done it many yes. times in your work, in your writing. Why does all of what architecture has to do for you come from outside of it? Well, in this yeah, other world, not all of it, but a lot right, of it right. has to I don't, come from this other yeah, kind of technology. I don't see it as uh, coming from outside of it except by an accident of history. I don't see it as coming from outside of it uh, um, in, in terms of what architecture is or does. Um, architecture has not, um, let's say, traditionally uh, referenced this stuff except – you know, in certain limited ways with people like Corbu, um, yeah. and to a certain extent, uh, well, maybe I was about to say Mies, but maybe not. Let's not even say that. Corbu's boat, the ship out, on, out of Sure, water. sure. You know, the eyes which do not see were looking at okay. things uh, for inspiration from okay. what would have been understood outside, been understood by his readers as outside architecture, but part of Corbu's argument was is this stuff is better architecture than what architects are making now. Yes. Uh, and so, so ideally, I would, because yeah. I really want to use this thing. You yeah. know, ideally, you know, the proof would be in the, yeah, you know, in, in the work itself. And yeah. so uh, my hope would be that it didn't feel, when you looked at it, like it was in its, in, in its position in the work or as the work uh, outside of architecture at that point. Um, uh -huh. Uh, that it is being domesticated, it is being brought within, it's being brought into what uh, uh, a more conventional understanding of architecture would be there. Okay. But since it's not prevalently, I'm going to do, if you don't mind, the questions at the end. Uh, since it, it doesn't, it's, it really, hold it. Anyway, if Remember it's not that. a prevalent, it, it, it seems to me that if this kind of work doesn't uh, proliferate in a certain way in the larger field of the production of buildings and architecture, which I think you could agree it doesn't. Um, okay. Sadly. Okay. Um, then, uh, the, again, I go to the distinction between what you do and, say, somebody like Corbusier. In fact, I have to quote you against yourself and, and, and actually compare you to someone you wouldn't, I don't think, find yourself comparable to. You made a discussion, you're constantly you're discussing the three architects, and you made a very brilliant discussion about the attitudes of your masters, your faraway mentors, uh, with how they treated technology. You talked about Corbusier, Mies. You talked about Wright, these three. And you differentiated them in a very interesting way. I, mean, I can't completely – the story is quite beautifully told, and I can't tell the whole of it. But you do say something interesting. You said that, you know, it was – Corb was really kind of an artist looking at technology with an imagination and, and thinking of it as the promise for a new world. So, as I said, something that would change all, all and everything about the world in a way. Uh, and, and, and Mies was quite skeptical. He was taming the beast, and he was civilizing uh, it in a way, uh, this, this product – this uh, – it needed to be classicized, in a way, by him. And Wright, you said, interestingly, uh, for Wright, uh, you know, he really threw it uh, away. He, he basically was, too, as you put it, too invested in his own personal vision to permit the technology any significant impact. And, and in quoting you, as his flying car designs attest, and so I thought about your, you know, your lawnmowers that uh, the peddler. 
uh, who is uh, exercising, is operating. I, I thought of your own fantastical architecture, which it cuts itself out of contemporary production, isolates itself in this world of a, of a possible um, other kind of uh, activated and, and functional architecture. But, you know, it's really too rarefied. It's too rarefied, it seems to me, to... Uh, it seems like it's the right problem, the Frank Lloyd Wright problem that you're having. In a way, you're too caught up in a personal vision of what technology does to really have what are the technologies that others are so invested in. Let's call them the digital the technologies. Uh, you know, uh, we'll get to that, the PCAD people and all that stuff, but not just the PCAD people, anybody who is, let's say, looking for a different model of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're too caught up in your personal vision to, to let the technology, let's say, of this particular, yes, this time, have an impact. I mean, you, you, despite your arguments for timelessness, you are quite invested, it seems to me, I should also point out before you rebut, uh, in the kind of moment in which Corbusier finds himself taking that ship out of the water, finds himself recognizing the potential of new methods of construction to be so powerful. You do, rep you do understand the connection between architecture and its time, so you can't entirely deny the importance of that either. You haven't denied it anyway in your writing. So, but what of this particular, this problem? Don't, how do you feel? Do you feel alone in his pursuit? I mean, do you, uh, I don't know how you... <laughs> Well, I, uh, there, there are others out there who are as <laughs> fascinated by technology. Uh, this kind, they use that uh, word too broadly. Well, I, you know, I, I, I would distinguish, say, for example, uh, uh, between us and, say, the Fosters and Rogers of the world who yes. are engaged in something that we, uh, that, 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 that the world calls high tech, but we would call, and pardon my French, haute tech, um, uh -huh. in order to indicate its. Uh, uh, it, it, its deviation from the interests of the technology proper into the, you know, the the world of fashion, you right. know, the domesticating of it in that in that sense. So while those people might un be understood typically to be um, allies of ours, we would kind of uh, pl say that you know they're they're continental and effete, and we are rough and tumble Americans interested in this kind yep. of more pragmatic uh, middle tech. Uh, sort of stuff, but I don't, uh, I don't see it at all as a personal vision. Again, I mean, this is a discussion mm -hmm. that actually comes up quite a bit in relation to our work because it is understood to constitute, for better or for worse, a signature these days. Uh, and it is ironic to us because for the last twenty odd years that we've been doing this, uh, we have uh, felt that the work and the graphics that we have used, all of the things that people typically accuse us of uh, um, wielding as a signature have all been done by us in a very hyper-conscious and self-conscious way as neutral to any personal vision, any personal or idiosyncratic uh, gesture or, or flourish or anything like that. Um, the challenge that I usually uh, offer to people who raise that is to point to any single instance in any of our pieces of work that could be s labeled as something done by a individual uh, uh, outside of the um, uh, exigencies of the program or the functionality, as it were, of it. And, I, and I'm, and I, and that that challenge has been taken up, and and I and I haven't lost it yet. So at that level, we don't see it personal as at all. But we do obviously. Um, uh, look at a, at a fairly narrow slice of the av possible available technology. And the reason we do that is, again, going back to the, set, to, to the belief that architecture's role, the point that its point is to, is, to, is to place us in the world in an engaging way that causes that world to come alive for us and, and, to, and to, draw, you know, to, to create a more vibrant experience, something that, frankly, uh, people might also pursue today under the uh, uh, umbrella uh, term of affect, um, uh, but uh, needless to say, we don't necessarily go there. Um, we would <laughs> not admit to it, at least. Um, uh, the stuff that we're looking at, the stuff that you see that is investing our work, is, again, in our minds, the stuff that's the most legible, the most directly evocative of the level of engagement that we want to sponsor uh, in the user, the viewer, the you know the client, whatever 
um, have you, uh, the, the interlocutor. I mean, really, okay. we like to imagine that our work is not a, 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 a signature, it's not, a, you know, a, a, an object of art or anything, but a, a conversant, an interlocutor, a companion, some, something with which the, the person interacts directly without an author uh, being in front of the design or alongside the design having to explain it or anything else. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there that is interested in that kind of level of engagement. And again, those people who are interested in affect would, would, would also um, uh, uh, probably um, subscribe to that, that interest. But again, what we're interested in is, is to the extent as possible, a kind of pre-conventional uh, uh, legibility to the work. Um, uh, because, because at the end of the day, uh, it seems to me still important that architecture be meaningful, not simply affective, uh, that it ultimately stand for not only the, that, that, the right that it gains for being there in your face is that it, it has some conviction about the particular sort of world that it is embodying, that it is placing you in. Because again, uh, it, it, it is something done by the few for the many that can never be done by the few. And so there's an ethical dimension to architecture uh, that, um, that also forces us toward the particular technology that, that invests our work. Now you're seeing it as a fringe marginal uh, weirdness and you know that's you know <laughs> we just don't see it that way but you know one way we've always characterized the work is as the vernacular as a vernacular of a community that just hasn't discovered itself yet that it is a vernacular of the future in a sense uh -huh. uh, that it's not Frank Gehry it's not uh -huh. my work you know these the signature is not me but is of the community that uh, would we'll uh, be it. able to read it, be able to yeah. interact with it in that engaged a way. Okay, I'm gonna, with that, it's a perfect segue. We need the right slide now. Um, the sli maybe the light's down a little bit more. A little lower on the lights is true. It will help because there are too many images, I think, for comparative reasons I've had to put many together. That is what's interesting. I mean, what you were talking about, this, 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 it's, a, it's very convenient, <laughs> what you've said now about this possible world of, of for living which would be a different one. And, and I think that this goes to the heart of something that really interests me in your work. I mean, we've seen an evolution of the domestic, of the domestic space, uh, many incarnations of it that I want to uh, turn now to, that I think you have uh, really steered in a very interesting direction that few have done so let's say, convincingly. I mean, for example, we see, and there is this problem today with of uh, the trans, let's call it the kind of um, transposition of certain codes of domesticity uh, from one context to another, let's say from the urban uh, context of an industrial space that we see this uh, use of, uh, of, of warehouses for living, the loft phenomenon. But I think Wes doesn't do stop there, I and mean, he's not only interested in that at all. In fact, he has immersed one in that condition as uh, as one where, I mean, he's already spoken to it, we can identify not only with the kind of texture, the tactility of that kind of brutal industrial material, but with the inaction, uh, the enactment of certain things that are not domestic. I mean, it's not normally that we're living with gantries and deliveries and, you know, I mean, here the, the space is enacting and the bed is moving and rolling on tracks. I mean, this is not uh, just saying that we are in a different atmosphere. Uh, so I think that's what makes it not part of this very limited emphasis on affect. Um, the, but, okay, going down now, here, here's the question that, that somebody might ask you, and might, maybe I wouldn't have this problem, really. I don't think it's my problem. I'm trying to set up straw men so we have a, I bring out of him his defenses. Uh, you know, there are different ways of handling this issue of displacement, of transposition, of transformation of experience. And one could say, for example, even in the case of Kulhas, when he introduces an industrial uh, element of, of great weight, of great presence, uh, something, let's say, that is not um, commensurate with the, the tactile and, uh, or the, the, the sens sensorial, the, the world of the, of, of the domestic space, which is, uh, let's say, compatible with human touch, with the, the vision and the projection of, of the, the tactility of things. When, when he introduces such things, 
he he's somebody who could say intelligent enough to know or with enough good judgment to know not to put that inside. He puts that giant beam, that big nasty eye beam. He puts it on the roof where it's it, just decoration. No, it's supporting the house. Or the, no, 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 no. Don't do that. That's not fair. <laughs> and when he puts the big elevator, you know, like you, uh, the moving thing into the house, and you could say this is the big freight elevator. Here he too is nostalgic, and he is, by the way. I mean, he's caught up in, or not nostalgic. He is, I don't know if you want to call it nostalgic. Historicist. He's an historicist, yes. He's remembering his, his, his club, his, 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 his uh, sorry, the athletic club argument uh, that he made about what the elevator does. He's transporting the city into the house. The whole of that model of urbanity now is, uh, you know, synthesized by that elevator, but it's a very refined work. I mean, look at that elevator. It's an exquisite, very sensuous, very uh, smooth object. This is not you, you know, just sort of invading the household with these things. No one, who wants to be with things like that? And then somebody else would say, and, 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 (laughs) And then look at somebody like this wonderful architect, old Giatti, and, and there are other architects who do that. They import the tectonics of things alien to the domestic uh, space that really we don't normally find in them, out of scale, uncannily uh, belonging to some other dimension of life. But it has the kind of rough hewn, the hand hewn. I mean, this is, uh, let's say, giant timbers. Again, there is a kind of cerebral and tactile resolution with uh, domestic life that you don't seem to care about or I, I don't know if you're indifferent to this and you're, or you're just pushing your own your personal project that you don't call personal or impersonal project that you don't call personal. I mean, what do you think about that kind of, I mean, look at the others who have dealt with this transposition of codes and, and how you do it. I mean, you go so much further because you're actually, an act, you're not just bringing in foreign material. You're bringing in foreign ways of oper- doing things. I mean, things are moving around. Things have... Right, but isn't that what we I, try to get our students to do even, to recognize that architecture isn't simply on the surface? I mean, uh-huh. uh, we have within our practice a, a, a uh, institutionalized distinction between inside and outside that we call uh, the hermit crab party, um, recognizing that the exterior of architecture has a responsibility, let's say, to the city, yeah. to communicate certain codes. And again, communication itself is is, is up for grabs nowadays. But uh, in our telling of it, to communicate certain things to the exterior and the interior has a responsibility, you know, to the specific clients and users that is and, – and often those are at odds. So if you imagine a hermit crab and the way that it can inhabit different shells – one can imagine a scenario where the shell is doing its job in relation to the exterior uh-huh. and then the hermit crab you know, mechanism or whatever it is, of which these are imperfect examples in here, are doing the things that need to be done on the interior. Now, as far as the relative fineness of that, I mean, I would just say that you know, these are nice, but they're kind of European, and this is American. <laughs> And, you know, this is John Deere, and this is, you know, whatever the European equivalent of that would be. In other words, I don't think that uh, uh-huh. uh, that, it, it, that it doesn't have a place in the house. It is part of our culture and history that – That we live with a forklift in our house? Is that well, a giant scale and rollers? Yeah, and yeah if we could afford it. Would you have But one? you don't do it. No, that's interesting when you're talking about the affording because you bring it down into the economy of the everyday. That's what the, why you said a minute ago, I think, it's part of our everyday life. The economy of it's in our everyday life, but that's not part of our everyday life of, of domestic living. I mean, but, but it's a it very rarefied. If, if we – let's imagine it then as a critical them. moment where yeah. we're not accepting the coding yeah. that is given to us by okay. society, but we are trying to – uh, de, you know, uh, yeah. deterritorialize the okay. potential of that activity okay. through introducing these other ways of doing things, uh-huh. uh, and and making use of of, of uh, existing technologies. Let's say that we find to be highly expressive and engaging. You know, uh, the idea that you could tune your environment uh, in, in, encourages you to interact with it in a, in a, in a way that causes that environment to become more alive for you. Uh, dwelling becomes a more active uh, pursuit rather than a passive one. Um, but, but I guess I'm skeptical because you're, you're doing it so blatantly. It's so, uh, you know, and you're not like that in a way. You're cunning, you're shrewd. I mean, your arguments are with vis-a-vis the history of architecture. 
you know, you're not slipping it in to the, the context in such a way that, like, for example, it could find itself happening through the market. It could find it's you a could different see game. people to it. You're 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 jumping into this alien world, yeah. and asking us to come with you. Well, again, we're not. We're starting from the presumption that it's not alien, but we are not stupid, and we recognize that it also is not that normal yet. Again, it is a vernacular for a time that hasn't happened yet. But um, uh, we very much value the, the this issue of uh, cleverness so that even where it appears blatant, I don't know whether, to be honest, I actually don't know what's coming up, what is even in the list of s slides on the left there, so I don't know oh. whether... Uh, but Which we try to use the material, the equipment, uh, or, or whatever, in a way um, that is clever. Uh, there, hopefully, you would get from the work there is a sense of humor in it, that humor is a pretty important part of everything mm -hmm. that we do. Uh, and so, uh, get to that. and and so that that <laughs> that level of cleverness <laughs> does invest even in even where it's blatant it's ideally blatant i mean we think of it as blatant in a in in a reasoned in, you know in a conscious way rather than a just dumbass you know bring a, a okay a forklift into the house okay we got two more rounds so we got to okay. okay. got to move quickly okay now i'm going to really venture into something that's risky and i don't know how you're going to react to this okay i want to talk to you about something else this going one's on. mine yeah, that's, that's Wes. About something else that I think might be where we could discover a different kind of contemporaneity in your work and, and, and get out of this dialogue only with the early modern period of architecture. Uh, one of the ways. This is the first. I think there's another one I'm going to show you too, but as a segue. Actually, we're about to have a really nice slide conjunction on the left now. That will go with this stuff? That will go with that this. will fit perfectly? After these, yeah. Okay. But so anyway, here's the argument. Uh, you know, you have this project on the on the primitive hut. It's a brilliant kind of, uh, let's say, very. You know, here's the thing that's so interesting about Wes. You you know, I went to the Museum of Modern Art, and there is this exhibit now on houses. And you know, you you're walking around, and there's this kind of, uh, you know, each and every project has a kind of way of dealing with its own problems. But you come upon Wes's work in the Museum of Modern Art, and you realize you're looking at someone who has clearly such a broad perspective. I mean, suddenly you're looking at a whole context. I mean, you're not sort of only seeing a single thing. So no matter that I've called it a very personal project, there's a way in which its didactic character establishes a lineage. And, and immediately, of course, you look at a project like this, you're looking at primitivism and you're looking at the, the modern of the 20th century. Uh, you're looking at this kind of collapse of time uh, you know, a, a piece this you can't see so well, canisters and rollers, again, these things that are me mechanized things. And, of course, the sun, I thought those must be something to do with being solar uh, energy devices and so forth. We're looking at this something that collects water. This is a machine that's operating in a very particular way. And then it's set upon the logging, uh, you know, the, the, those, those joists that are for moving it, but that are, of course, potentially for a very different kind of, uh, historical figure who would, in the period of the primitive HUD, have been a logger, uh, you know, and this would represent a certain uh, kind of um, uh, vocational purpose in, in, in the base of the house, the history of the house. Anyway, this collapse of time, it seems to me, is con completely contemporary in a certain way uh, because I think it connects to many such aims to to render time uh, a kind of uh, very transposable uh, proposition in a way. And, and then I see there are other kind of cultural practices today that this might relate to, one of them being steampunk, which is a certain kind of movement underway, well, it was in the 80s and 90s, wherein a very eclectic kind of attention to certain uh, uh, kinds of technology uh, were, was really the motive. There was a kind of... Uh, an interest in proto-submarines and steam locomotives and uh, brass uh, uh, diving bells, uh, uh, all of these strange things that then would be transposed into a contemporary world in which they could move toward a reality just as you said. They could project a world that then was impossible but that now would be in, if then renegotiating with the, all of the technologies available with, to us today that somehow the 
the collapse of these kind of uh, now anachronistic technologies, you know, the old typewriter with the new, uh, just to give you one example there. This kind of superimposition uh, did that. Now, I, I want to sort of comment and ask you something about this. Here, I, here I'm going to be quite critical again, if you don't mind. By you the way, when I started this whole thing, you could try. Wes, I told Wes we're going to have trouble because I wanted to get into a kind of debate, and I was having trouble disagreeing on many points that he was that's, making. That's Jack, by the way. No, Jack, okay. But anyway, yeah, Jack. Jack, even we discussed the name of Jack. When, yeah, that's right. And, yeah, before Jack was Jack. The sun. Um, anyway, up west. <laughs> I just had a conversation with someone else who's coming to the school about the, his, his daughter's name, Cameron. Oh. Everybody seems to ask me you, about so the name before like the guy, name. Yeah, who would? Is, is given. I, it's, honor, it's such an honor to be asked <laughs> what the name of one's child might should be. I mean, wow. Anyway, <laughs> Cameron's child's name is Imogen, a, a beautiful name. A, really quite an astonishing name. Anyway, um, and I said, wonderful, you know. Actually, at first I said I didn't like it. And he was... <laughs> yeah, you said, you said you didn't like Jack first. You I didn't know. like Jack at the beginning, and then I grew, then to, decided, grew to like it. Is how, that what's how, happening yeah. today? I don't know. Well, anyway, the point is that I think uh, I want to find this disagreement. So here we are, and I'm going to ask you this. This kind of thing that happens in steampunk... Now, I don't think it's the same as what's happening with you, because I don't think you're combining, except for in that one project, you know, you're combinations of technology uh, problems. I mean, you, you do combine solar and energy uh, kinds of... Uh, I'm sorry. So, we have so, other images of it, too. Sorry? There are other images of it, but uh, not, not here. Your, sorry. Okay. You, you do have kinds of uh, things to do with sustainability that are operating in the context of your mechanization and your ma mm -hmm. machinic kind of stuff. And so, you know, they're kind of working together in a different way than they would had you not brought those two together. You have things like this, but... I don't think they go to this kind of, of – they don't deal with anachronisms. And because I have to agree with you, by the way, because at first I thought all of this technology you use in your architecture is so anachronistic, it's nostalgic. And, you know, in the end it isn't because there's, we still have forklifts and we still have all these drop gates. How could I claim that it's really this stuff is anachronistic? It isn't. That's not the problem. Okay. I got you. I mean, I, I'm with you on that. But it's this kind of eclecticism, this kind of superimposition, this friction between different technologies that, in, that you are playing on that to me is both very contemporary, goes to this kind of stuff, like the steampunk thing, uh, but seems to me really motivated by something else. Okay, I'm going to tell you what it is. Wait, okay. don't go yet. Oh, Here's so it. it. It's a kind of distanti what I call a distantiation device, a distancing device. What you do by doing this and I think these guys do that, oh, I mean, the, the, the women and the guys who do this stuff with the, the punk, the steampunk. You know, they go and they wear these super regressive things, these super they're – they're costumed. They're in the garb of, a, you know, of an era. They're in this era. You know, the chain is hanging out of the pocket. It's the chain that does not belong to, you know, J.P. Morgan, but it's sort of that chain. Uh, it's, it, they're, they're in another time. They are, in a way, in a transcendent time, or in a time which is not of this time. It's in this time and out of this time, and it, it, it allows them to stand uh, back aloof and at a distance. It allows them to, to criticize everyone else. There's a certain kind of privileged position in it, a supremacy and a, and, a and a critical position it puts them in that I wonder whether you think is part of this strategy. I mean, you know, you've sort of used this in a very intelligent way. And then, of course, you're constantly, you know, you're, you know, you're lashing at the PCAD people and, you know, Peter. And, and, you know, everybody is subject to a very – it gives you – and it's great because who out there does work that, you know, gives them the, the platform to make those criticisms? So, anyway, I just wanted to hear your reaction about whether the strategy had something to do with that kind of – uh, I, I wish we were so clever. I mean, I have to say uh, it, that is a new take. I have not heard that before. Um, I feel beleaguered rather than aloof. Uh, uh -huh. And so um, if my words, uh, my combativeness were having any effect, then I would feel kind of smug and say, you know, you got me there. But – at the end of the day, I don't know that ultimately anybody's listening anyway. So, you know, there's a small group of people that that un, in, in, ultimately I'm talking to, and we talk. We 
understand each other's language and, and amuse ourselves and, and console ourselves with the, the uh, example of the work itself. And as long as each instance of that is something that, you know, you can be proud of instead of ashamed of, then, you know, that's enough in a way for a practice uh, today. Uh, sadly, one would like to have more influence, but that's not the case. The steam bunk thing is kind of interesting because I have to say that um, uh, that 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 um, merges into the um, uh, you know I want to say decorative. It starts to go way past where we would ever imagine that we were going. I mean, we hate bolts, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, we much prefer welded okay. connections because the bolt has become a kind of a fetish object, a symbol of a particular sort of thing. Yeah. And we're not interested in being symbols for things. We're interested in being the things themselves. Yes. And so that layer of expression, that that layer, and and the layer of expression wherein you could assume some kind of strategy like that was happening, is that repugnant right. for us. Got it. Okay. We got a quickie here, and then the final round thing. I mean, this is sort of a segue thing. I mean, here the other contemporary moment in your work is the is the appropriation of the problem of branding. Now, and, and this goes to some of your issues with uh, cartoon and comic uh, representation. Uh, and, and, I, and I think what brings this so close to the contemporary in a certain way um, has something to do with a comparison like this, um, where, you know, we have uh, even the color palette being so close. This, this one's ours. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, that is not a doctored comparison. That's really know. the right, the color. That's it. Wow. I said cheat if you need to, and he didn't need to, you know. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, he said, oh, no problem. There's so many. This is Blair Cranston in my office. He said, oh, there's so many. So anyway, where the color comes together. So, I, but I wanted to just uh, point to this exchangeability, this branding as a sign of mobility. Again, a mobility is introduced here, but of a very ephemeral type, you know, with an ephemeral value as opposed to you know, a marketable value, having to do with exchange and communication, not with the actual movement of mechanical parts. Here you're, you're, you're introducing another kind of interest which seems to me to go to something more of this time, more contemporary, but then suggests to me in a funny sort of way, or it makes me want to ask you, does this mean that the architecture, as opposed to its representation, is never contemporary since it's all about not being branded? I mean, you're absolutely against branding and the signature uh, and the icon. Uh, so, uh, you know, it sort of means that there's a real schism here between what you're talking about in your representation and how you appeal to the contemporary the contemporaneity there. And when I say contemporaneity in this one, and I think I want to distinguish this from the PCAD thing, I'm talking about something more like your interest in the immediate, the being, the thing being itself the thing, the, the sense of connection that's right. tactile re and very direct. I mean, the iPod thing, where, you know, the connection to that, that world is, is absolutely something felt and, 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 and you know, actual. Right. So, but there is a real disparity here. I mean, do you want to comment on well, that? Well, I think that the previous images are, are, are more to your point because, frankly, uh, the coincidence here is in uh, the color Well, but everything else that, where you got to your right, brain. Right, right. Whereas everything else in that image was absolute, I would claim absolutely neutral. I know, but you do, you do cartoon your work that way. You do introduce this aesthetic, which in a way suggests it's a product, or that it has something to do with the exchange of things in the market as if it's product. It's not the communication that belongs inside the discourse of architecture. That's what I'm trying to say. I think you've imported a very different mode in a very intelligent, you know, and no one else has done this, by the way. This is a very original and powerful part of architecture, of, of the work of Wes. I mean, by the way, I don't know if you all know, but this whole side, you know, it's everywhere in our culture of architecture. You know, the log on log is Wes's log. You know, and it's not the log at the bottom of his, of his uh, primitive hut. But, but anyway, you know, the cartoon of the log, on the logo of log, the journal log. So anyway, I wanted to put it here. I'm sorry, I forgot to put There's it here. This, no, the logo, though, you didn't put yeah, it. Yeah, Did yeah. you? Did you put your logo in there? No, 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 no. Okay, but you understand you've got logos all over this pro-con uh, right. 
project on the right, Sears, Roebuck. Uh, I don't remember them all. Do you have? Well, here, this is Barbie. Yeah. And this is Lionel, and that's Martha Stewart, and that's Sub Zero, Gateway, and Sears. And I frankly couldn't identify the other ones, but there's a bunch more. The, the logoing thing is here now transposed <sighs> into architecture, but it, but you're, I think you're logoing also in your representation. I do. I don't, and the color thing is not the point, but the point, the color thing was to say those colors aren't in architectural representation. That's not the color palette of, that's not, no one else has that color but they, palette. But they are You're in, the, in the industrial world. Yeah, but there, uh, no one else in architecture has your color palette. Uh, I don't know anybody who has it, so. Well, I think uh, maybe Rem, Rem used to sort have of, it. sort yeah, of has it. Yeah. But he doesn't use it that way. It's not a graphic material the way you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, certainly the logofication of these things uh, goes with their nature as the shipping containers and and basically advertises uh, what's inside. I mean, basically what's what's happening here, and you'll you'll notice a difference between a lot of our other container projects in, in the images that might have gone by on the left. But this is intended to be a, a, a sort of a – maybe not a critique, but an expression of that suburban condition wherein uh, we are competing with the neighbors uh, and are trying to uh, uh, show the neighbors that we have more cooler stuff than they do. So we have the big SUV in the driveway. We have the big, massive TV visible through the plate glass window, uh, the picture window and all. And and through the, the very natural agency of the way that these things work anyway, um, one can advertise what's inside these. I mean, basically, the system is you would buy these things from the various manufacturers whose logos you see there, and they would be, you know, a gateway home office, a Sears bedroom, you know, Sub-Zero kitchen, Martha Stewart entry device, you know, Lionel boys' bedroom, uh, and um, Barbie-themed girls' bedroom. And so that these various country companies would offer these containers as – uh, to to the suburban household, and they could you know combine them on their site and and basically. So I just want to point out everybody that's you know the lawn. You're on. It's a different oh, color. I do. Okay, different color too. That's the you know where the, you know I, I I do my exercise my while I'm mowing the lawn while I'm right mulching uh, the grass uh, the, the, the you know everything and and generating energy. But I just wanted to point that out to you all. Okay, last round. This is it. I want to talk about what I really am interested in his work, finally, really at a more architectural level, just quickly, and get him to respond to it. It seems to me the thing that really is significant about what Wes does to really put the, go straight to the point for me is that he is dealing with a certain part of the architectural problem that almost every architect has either ignored or been perplexed by or f really failed in a very, let's say, profound way to understand uh, and that is the infusion of the mechanical systems into buildings. Uh, I wanted to talk about two other models uh, and criticize some other examples to, to help you understand what I think has happened. On the one hand, we have the box, uh, the mechanical box, which is, proliferates everywhere in the city. This is right around the corner, Raphael. This is not far, far away, IIT. Uh, sorry, uh, C, uh, the ICA. Uh, in all in these projects, you know, I would say we are, and right next door we have a great case of it with Harry Cobb's building. We are somehow to accept a certain set of cultural condition, uh, conventions about architectural reception in which the, the presence of those boxes is assumed, uh, you know, not present. Uh, these boxes are assumed simply not to be part of the form of the building. And I'm quite astonished, by the way, that again and again, even an architect like Raphael, uh, these very dexterous and wonderful composers of architecture w have not been able uh, again and again to uh, deal with this problem and simply accept this I I in invisibility. The, 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 we do not see these things. It's, it's kind of incredible. It's like there are two different regimes of vision in, in the world of buildings. And, and one is invisible and one is visible the building itself as opposed to the, those things. Then came uh, some very intelligent reflections on this question. I'm not going to talk about, of course, the, the one that everybody, the, the real kind of canon work in the 20th century, which is Kahn, but rather his protege, Venturi, where, for example, and there are reasons for that, it has to do with Wes, uh, where we see, for example, a very interesting game where we take, for example, the mechanical 
The mechanical is there are huge uh, vents, sorry, are in, in the wall of this building in Princeton, at the laboratory in Princeton, absolutely gigantic. And I'm sorry this doesn't express so well, but the dimension of this, the far head of the building, the tripartite classical facade that grows from a base of extreme diminutive scale where we enter it, uh, then to this mid-range scale, uh, and finally this giant area, and going from the most penetrable to the, the, this kind of transparent porosity, uh, semi-porosity, to this deep cut where the mechanical system is used linguistic, the mechanical bent, the venting, the, 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 the exhausting, uh, is used to scale and transform and distort in, a, you know, in an extreme way uh, a set of conventions about the facade. Uh, it's one of those kind of maneuvers of Venturi, very, very clever and, and very knowing. Um, and then comes Wes, and he, t he, he has a building, which is at UCLA to deal with a problem, not a building. Here we go. It's not a building. This is uh, a chiller at an enormous scale, in a way, occupying a site. And normally, with, let's say, architecture would come along, and it would cloak it. It would cover it. Uh, it uh, or, or, well, yes, it would do that. And then I think what's so extraordinary about this work is that he has worked in a kind of terrain between architecture's task of concealing the mechanics and also adopting them as part of its uh, form. Uh, you can't see so well, but one of my favorite moments, for example, is when an exhaust uh, pipe now is inserting itself and forcing this screen to roll up, and the consequence of it rolling up is, is and then played out elsewhere. All the while, this has something to do with, uh, 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 sorry, distributing movements of air, and then parts of the facade are falling out and exhausting. And we see that architecture is co-opting technology, the technology of this kind of mechanized thing, and, and, and thereby the mechanization, the mechanical material becomes architectural. It's this two-way, it's this mutuality, this extraordinary kind of synthesis. Uh, and just behind this building, by the way, is Venturi's lab, not this one, but another lab of Venturi. And you see these two, and this goes to something of great interest, by the way. This is completely a side comment about uh, Wes, which has to do with this conversation uh, among architects. This is where he participates in a broader cultural project of architecture in time. But it's interesting to see that conversation. I want to point out to you another terrible failure in this question. Uh, which I saw this summer. There the building was going up, and I was so happy to see it. Very exciting uh, the project, as you all know. It's just incredible, the scale, the scalelessness of this non-oriented geometry, this disoriented, this, uh, you know, Im implicit, uh, implicitly uh, uh, toroidal kind of geometry. And, and, and it was going up, and I'd seen it a number of times, and only this time, just going a few weeks, uh, no, months ago now, two months ago, I saw, and it was really quite a shock that that uh, you know the close view because that's where I see the hotels are all near here. For all of you going to Beijing, uh, there are so many hotels by this building that the mechanical is in this mid-range, and it corresponds the, the, these exhaust vents uh, to the scale of a single level in the building, and it scales the building immediately, and the building shrinks so precipitously and returns to the most banal and ordinary dimension. It is a devastating uh, moment, really, mm. uh, which speaks to this problem even at the level of the articulation of the grill uh, and the question of scale. Because for me, Wes, and I think you might share this view, one of the primary tasks of architecture is to rescale the ordinary construction of buildings to rescale it and transport it into some other domain by doing so. And I think you do that with your transpositions of the right. of uh, the technology. But the, the corollary to that, though, is that buildings are always smaller than you think they are. You, you become familiar with buildings through slides like this, and then you yeah. go see them in person, and they're not really nearly as big as you thought. That, that chiller plant, you know, it's several hundred feet long. It's a huge building, but when you go to it, it's not really that big, you know. It kind of feels comfortable. You Do you know? think when buildings, when you discover buildings to be bigger than you thought that they would be, that they're better, or do you think the discovery of, of even greater diminutive, I mean, it, it, the discovery that they're smaller is the more 
uh, you know, I have to say, uh, I have, I can't think of any where they're bigger, but I have been immensely satisfied in discovering the shrinkage. The, the shrinkage I have to. Uh, I'm glad you when said. you actually experience it. It's an real. amazing thing, by the way. Yeah, anyway, yes. I, I have to tell you, I'm so glad you said that. We're so together on this. <laughs> no, really, this is an amazing and important thing. I don't know why, and I would love to sort of figure this out and write about it or something, but. In the cases when buildings shrink, it is a remarkable and very successful outcome, mm -hmm. <laughs> but more so. But, okay, I want to end with a critical point about this whole thing, though. Despite all of that, and I think that building, you know, is really such a – to me, that building is an architect who found the commission to realize their thesis. I mean, he did it also in the, astro in the astronaut's memorial where the mechanical operation of the memorial – is so suited to the problem of, 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 of the commemorative uh, project that he was dealing with. Um, so Wes has happened upon, and I think all of the architects with a very particular project, uh, all of those architects discover the project in which to realize their, their thesis. Um, but here we have, and here another interesting case is in um, San Jose. Oh, I can't wear this thing. It's just impossible. Hold on. Um, I'll try one more time. In San Jose, the theater, I think it's the repertory theater, the whole building is articulated as a mechanical shelter in a way. If you look at the boxes that I pointed to, imagine that the whole building, the, whole, the mechanical box inflates to such a dimension that it can absorb almost the entire building, that the rest of the building, that what we would call the architecture, is compressed into this kind of base. And, I, you know, the orbital kind of implication, the, the oblique, the rotation of it in plan, which you see there, and which engages the site in a very particular way, very strategic way, uh, establishes, a, you know, as Wes said to me the other day, through a kind of projection, an encounter with the human subject, the body in motion in space, but only at a distance because the scale here is not ergonomic, which I was critical with him about. I mean, that that kind of illustration of movement I have a problem with, but I'm not going to deal with that now. What I really wanted to talk to was whether or not how you deal with your work on this problem of the mechanical box, the, the grill, the, the substance of this intrusion of mecha mechanisms in architecture in different programmatic contexts. You see, because for me, this is interesting, this one, because it's, it's drifting out. The theater is a blank box. You could say the theater blank box is quite susceptible to being something like a mechanical box because it's mute, as are the mechanical boxes, in a way. But why should a theater be a mechanical box? Again, I, it's interesting here, we're not seeing you deploying your, your project as you do at the Astronauts Memorial, as you do in, uh, in UCLA. We're seeing you applying it again by, because of your own thesis of architecture, not because of the conditions that you're happening upon. Well, I think that, you know, our, the thesis that we have is broad enough to uh, handle any uh, program. Again, as, as I said earlier, if everything is an aspect of technology, uh, then everything uh, finds a connection to being considered in this way. And in incidentally, we sold this to the client as a magic box, uh -huh. not a big piece of mechanical <laughs> not, not equipment. A, uh, mechanical yeah. shelter box. Right, exactly. And these are little little baby versions there that are the actual mechanical uh -huh. uh, equipment. Um, but uh, one of the things that we have always done in the, in the practice, maybe in a naive way, is to reimagine the program as, uh, at the largest scale, a machine for something and as a collection of, of smaller machines for something. So we try to reimagine the program in terms of uh, things that it can do, activities that it, it can per, um, uh, perform. And so in the case of the uh, rep theater, the biggest thing that it could do was, uh, was uh, highlight the, what you can't see in those images, the pedestrian pathway that kind of di goes diagonally through the blocks. Uh, in the redevelopment area of San Jose there. And so we rotated uh, the volume of the theater. We placed the rehearsal hall above the housed 
in order to um, absorb the kind of characteristic high school auditorium fly loft to main house uh, uh, massing and, and create the more kind of cubic form and then rotate that whole thing uh, to uh, take account of that um, pedestrian path um, uh, through there. Uh, and it rotates ar around the stage uh, as if it was a big slewing ring. Uh, but, but you didn't uh, – we're going to have to wrap up because I do want to take questions. Sure. But what you're not describing to me, I guess, is why there you're, evoke, you're invoking again the grill, the corrugation, the implication that there is a connection back to this in, intrusion of the – Well, in this animal. particular case, the corrugation okay. was simply texture. Uh, we wanted uh, to – we had big blank so surfaces. Am I wrong? Is that a giant mechanical box with a theater inside? Maybe. Do you mind that? No, no, that's fine. That's fine. But I mean, we we I certainly. Like, I mean, I, yeah, I we that. we would not I have. I love the idea of the inversion. That right. All of the, you go. You know, you take Venturi's forehead. and You just the whole thing just gets sucked into. It. Right. Right. You know, the next project would be to be no base. You know, that sound when something disappears in a cartoon. It, <laughs> that's where this is going, and then we're right. back into the rest of your work. Where all of architecture is ex, you know, what should I say, sent out and then replaced with mm -hmm. the new possible. Future well, I, I mean, I, I and the world. people in the office would be pleased with that reading, but again, it's nothing we've ever made explicit, you know. Though as we sit around the table and make sound effects as we're figuring out <laughs> what to do, that's uh, one of the sounds you yeah, made. Yeah, that was that would be one of but the. You sound. see that base is very little architectural. I mean, the old architecture, the idea of the, of the plant, right. the idea that the building, the visible part. Of architecture you know, has all but disappeared. Okay, wait. Now, now we got to stop. There was a question, and I don't know if it's still there. But now we're opening the floor briefly the because we've gone on far we too long. To the... I had too many rounds in this, but um, let's try to open it up for a few minutes. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. seems to be visual as much as it is – for instance, you're talking about a very specific technology. It's not like um, – I don't really buy that it's sustainable, Scott, like you were saying, that he's dealing with sustainability. He has and some projects like that deal He might have a project like that, I think. But I don't, I don't think that's the general project, let's say. It's no. much more about movement and the, the image of movement. But that's haptic, not visual. But it's the image of movement. So it's a, you know, however you want to. Because movement's expensive, and all you get yeah, is the but, image. But it could look, I mean, it looks like uh, storage containers, and it looks like, I mean, you have a couch that I never saw that before, but it was coming down from the ceiling, and you sit on it, and you watch a TV. But that and, moves. Or, and things like this. It's, it's, not, it's not like you're talking about a heat gain on it or uh, rainwater collection systems and all these things that, that may be part of it, but that doesn't seem like it drives it. And I think it comes through when you think about the – and Scott already mentioned this about the relationship to color, you know, because the, the color is a way to – I mean, I think it's, I think it's very shrewd. Uh, your use of color, I, I love it. I think it's, it's beautiful, but I also – it's there to try to erase the – both erase the tectonic and also per make it permanent in a sense. It, it sort of gets rid of the differentiation of all the parts, but it actually makes it even more present as an image. Uh, sure. I mean, one is confronted with the choice of using color. Uh, we try to use it in as uh, objective a way as possible, recognizing you can only say that in quotes nowadays. Um, but uh, – in terms of the, the sense of the stuff being visual, I mean, that is uh, because architecture is that as well. And so we tend to be interested in reference and use that technology, which is most um, uh, evocative. Wow. This is not my computer. But most, you know, that, that ha it has the possibility of having the most effect that way. <laughs> um, so uh, – at the end of the day, ultimately, we are uh, um, uh, a slave to the particular budgets we get, and we would love – I mean, there's a whole argument here that we didn't really talk about 
about the potential and place of movement as another dimension in architecture that has been excluded or marginalized you know, since the beginning. Architecture is that which doesn't move, which is fixed. But there's nothing intrinsic to architecture or the architectural or the sense of architecture that should be, be that way. I mean, we, we of course know about frozen uh, uh, music and, and the like, and the Baroque has an iconography of movement, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, ultimately I predict, and, and, and Calatrava is perhaps one of the, you know, most pathetic examples of that, but that architecturally scaled movement is the next potential uh, um, a dimension that architecture will take on. So we begin to talk about the choreography of a space as well as its massing, its materiality, its proportions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that is in the back of our minds, though we have not yet had an opportunity to actually do anything at an at important scale besides these sort of furniture scale things that, that were hopefully evident in the slides. Yes. And somebody up there, I think. You said something at the beginning uh, that struck me the, uh, uh, on your definition of the PCAD, and you used the word authorless. My question to you is uh, how much are you uh, uh, ready to defend yourself, your identity, against technology, and how much you're going to give up on it? in the sense that a lot of the stuff that you show and a lot of work that you do is based on technology. Technology, in a way, steals your identity after a little bit, like uh, the inventor of the forklift or the inventor of the I-beam. We don't know about these people, and they don't really matter anymore because technology stole their design. So in a way, you may fall into the same trap. My question is, is it a trap to you, or is it actually you are really want to give in to that? In the kind of sense of, you know, the word thought, Faber, I think it's homo faber, homo fabricatus, I meaning it's like homo you make faber. the tool, and then the tool makes you. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's actually a, a really uh, good question. The, the issue of authorlessness for us is really a question of the evidence in the object of the willfulness of uh, the human connection to another uh, uh, person. Um, and this is where we would distinguish between ourselves and the oat tech. The oat tech is so highly factored, so completely uh, um, factory produced that there is no hand, there is no evidence of a human being associated with them. They could have landed from outer space. They are all, all the fittings, the, you know, the bright, shiny fittings and everything are all alien. Uh, as far as we're concerned. They don't have a sense of the hand in it. Now, by that I don't mean something so crude as the chisel marks in the, you know, the stone of the rusticated base, but rather uh, the sense of the distribution of these factored elements, like we always use standard steel sections, uh, channels, wide flanges, angles, and the like. We don't, we rarely use tubes or, uh, or th uh, sections where, um, when they're all put together, they uh, uh, tend to um, make the putting together of them disappear. Uh -huh. And, and they, it's as if they, like a car, came out of a factory untouched by human hands. Um, so that's the dimension in which we're concerned with authorlessness. Now, in the case of the PCAD, we're obviously talking about scripting, things where there is a, a, a – and, and, and there's a history to pre PCAD, which actually had a very strong political and social dimension when it first started in the early 90s, uh, but that has all kind of wandered away. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, the authorlessness we're talking about there is that which, which intentionally distances the, the person writing the script from the result, condemns them to basically choosing one among many possible uh, outcomes um, – uh, and uh, takes it, and, and on the positive side, takes it beyond where they could have ever gone themselves, anything they could have actually willed into existence by a linear design process. But the, the fear that I, ha I would have in, in, in the case, uh, in the face of that, is that that also removes the connection, the human connection, and starts to make them alien in a, in a kind of literal way. And since architecture has this kind of ethical responsibility, um, uh, uh, to, to, to create a war, to, to deserve to be there uh, in your face all the time, um, 
that the uh, ultimately the only way that connection can be forged, the only way it can deserve to do that is through the care of the people that actually made it or designed it uh, in the end or you know uh, used the tools that that created it and and you know it's kind of squishy you know again i'm not talking about chisel marks or weld marks or anything like that you know i'm talking about the sense that the mm -hmm. thing has in its in its in the the order of its fabric um, that there's a mind behind it rather than just a bunch of uh, abstract. Uh, that there's a process behind it because the process, you know, the extrusions, the assembly, the, the, the manufacture and distribution of those materials, there, there are other things entail. There's a whole, sure. you know, right. I and mean, you can't see that at all when it's sub sublimated by, for example, a project like the, when, when everything is welded smooth, for example, as the, the, the the Olympic Stadium. The conti and a continuous of, uh, differentiation. You the know, steel the, stadium of right. Herzog and Marin. You don't see it at all. Is that, would that be an example of that? Um, well, I, you know, or do you it think could there's be, enough roughness I, there? But that's uh, well, not the goal. That roughness is not something we're to see, really. Right, no, of course not. Really close inspection of the kind that has nothing to do well, with it. Well, yeah, the tectonic reality of that thing is not, it's, it's intended to be astounding, not to be legible as a tectonic. You know, Isn't that event. the PCAD goal to to be able to mystify the the, uh, mean, the modes of production? Well, frankly, I wouldn't know what the goal was, but uh, it seems to me that uh, you know to be diffused in a cloud of affect is you know something uh -huh. one reads about as an intention. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. Amorphous shape building, which is also a reference to digital technology. Well, a shipping container is not a reference to an. Uh, it is itself that technology. It is that thing. Right, but we don't. But I would say at this particular point in time, again to get back to the that mm -hmm. we don't know that we have no sense of that. There is no. Um, uh, there, there are no standards that have been developed. Um, there is no industry. There is no culture. There is no world for which that amorphous form, which could be like this, or it could be like that, or it could be like that, or it could be, you know, there's nothing, there's no means of judging its, its goodness or appropriateness. It has not been the subject uh, or product of a kind of extended evolution like these other examples. Um, that, that frankly we prefer to uh, use. But it is very much true that if architecture's role is to place us in the world, um, that leaves open the question for, for what that world is and how that world is to be understood. Now, I would make the additional distinction that it is to place us in a world that is available to our perception. So in other words, while we may think that string theory is the best way of describing reality now, String theory is not really a viable option for architecture to embody or represent. It's existing at a, a, a beyond human perception. Ultimately, architecture is for people. People are of a certain scale. Their, their, the, their, their perceptual apparatus kind of can span to a certain range. And so architecture is not, in my mind, properly uh, concerned with the issues cosmological or astronomical and microscopic. And to a certain extent, the digital uh, uh, dwells more often in that realm. So, for example, the, the wiggly thing that you were talking about, um, the continuously differentiated surface, um, there is no purchase there. There is no uh, sense of the figure there. There is no sense of scale um, that I think would allow the, the, the connection that, that I've been kind of trying to advocate through the dimension of the kind of technology that we uh, are interested in disposing in our in our work. Okay. Aren't there two scales at least? You spoke about oh well, we don't have any more chisel marks. But there are lots of buildings which are clearly handcrafted buildings because the inside is completely carved of stone or wood and the artist would have been horrified if anyone told him he'd left chisel marks in the saint's face or the arch or the blocks or anything but yet there are buildings nowadays and some people make the distinction between a supremely well-crafted building and a supremely well-assembled building 
If you look at something like the CCA, which is this great big building, but as you walk through it, you are immediately aware, if you have any kind of architectural literacy, of the fact that somebody had to design the little fixtures and somebody had to turn the little, uh, I don't know, their knobs or something to keep the birch panels together. And as you walk through it, you are aware that a human being not only designed it but made these things and then some of the humans assembled according to a plan. So the the great artistry is not in the assembly of those little spun aluminum fixtures and the birch panels, but rather the human touch of those panels and the human touch of the complete assembly. And it's essentially two levels of literacy, two levels of craftsmanship, and two levels of uh, awareness and human connection, I guess you could say. And, and ultimately, that building is no less well-crafted than an interior that is completely hand-carved and could never be duplicated by anything but a digital carver nowadays. And ultimately, they're not the same, but they're also not one is better than the other. They're just ways in which people perceive things and people do things to give an effect, which is ultimately a human connection and a human, um, well, experience of a moment. And I wonder if when I looked at the um, container house, I got the same feeling, not because the containers are handmade, or not because even the fact that human beings had to assemble them that way, but more importantly, that that wasn't random. That was neither computer generated out of a, out of a random computer program, nor was it the way somebody happened to pile a bunch of containers. Somebody chose that, you said earlier, there's a human mind behind this, there's a human decision. And ultimately, I think those connections to scale and humans' ability to perceive between the microscopic and the cosmic, um, it's actually a pretty, pretty big range. And to deny that range is to sort of deny the fact that people are going to use the buildings and it sort of becomes self-indulgent to build them at all when in fact everybody, every designer is self-indulgent. But only you can only be self indulgent until you have to eat. Let's let's get his response now. Just uh, well, I'm not quite sure what the. Uh, I mean, I yes, I agree. Uh, I didn't realize I was denying the range. Uh, but, but maybe somewhere in there, something about a skepticism about your condemnation of the reception of material that you call not yet uh, with. Uh, you didn't use the word traction. You used another word. Right. Well, I'm not. Uh, what was the word? I, I'm not sure. I is. Did you mean the ICA? Or the CC, what's the CCA? Yeah, but in reference to your PCAD, right? We well, not the CCTV tower. You just have oh, 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 oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I don't I, know I apologize. that. Apologize. Sorry. All these acronyms. <laughs> but no. But what do you do with the uh, the digital, the PCAD, the production of this immersion and effects that you say is unaccount, or it can't be accounted for in terms of a measure? Or you used another word. You didn't use it. Uh, I can't remember the name, the word it used to describe. It would be something like it entering into a sphere of criticality or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you put it, but he's basically saying there is the possibility, it seems to me, of grasping it. And at some other levels, well, there yeah, are many no, levels of human are, production yes, or I technology. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to – what I am condemning in the PCAD is the distance – so to the extent, I mean, I certainly imagine the use of these tools uh, in a controlled way as a tool where you are in uh, command, so to speak, or connected to the results and uh, reacting to them on, on a real-time basis and not uh, uh, using them as a means of getting beyond yourself, uh, the, ca the cap capacity to do good, useful, and cool stuff. Uh, with them, um, it may not be the kind of stuff that I think is most appropriate, but I think that at the end of the day, the human element uh, could certainly find its way back in there, um, at which point then the wiggliness becomes more of a fashion statement uh, uh, than a, uh, a, a, a unforeseen effect of the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's certainly possible that that uh, might be the case. I mean, 
I would not uh, – hopefully I'm not so naive as to believe that, you know, the prescriptiveness that I'm laying out, you know, I'm assuming is the only – potential. I'm basically, re I feel like I'm responding to the injunction to care that's laid on me by the ethical paradox at the foundation of architecture uh, that, that the, the stuff I do has to be the stuff that I think is the, be is the correct thing to do, recognizing that, you know, I am one person and there's another person here and there and, and, and they'll all, they might all have different, but that doesn't, mean that I, I'm not obligated to fight for or, or uh, uh, try to convince the world that my view is the most appropriate uh, way to do it. Okay. Um, oh, okay, Inga, last slide. No, We've got to end it. Okay. But, Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we, um, again, going back to the question of uh, what's ar what architecture's role is, I mean, I wouldn't say we're caught in a mechanical paradigm so much as reveling in a mechanical paradigm. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the architecture has always lagged behind the technology available, um, so th for one thing. Uh, but there, it may be that the, the reason for that is that human beings continue to be human beings. And so it may take more than the 10 or 15 years for human consciousness, human common sense, human and cultural understanding and comfort and, uh, and, and legibility to be uh, as uh, familiar or uh, as uh, um, uh, comfortable with the – actual technology that's available uh, at the time um, as it continues to be, or in our minds at least, with, you know, the mechanical, the object-oriented uh, mechanical uh, type of stuff. Now, S Sanford Quinter, uh, who's going to be here, I guess, uh, has uh, uh, proposed a interesting view on this that really resonates with our interest in science fiction, which you may or may not have been able to guess from the work, uh, which is that <laughs> the role of the of the kind of work that you're talking about, um, which is likely because of the available technology, to become let's imagine hyper complex and elaborate. Patterns are a big kind of fashionable thing now, uh, and and that sort of thing. That that Sandy's actually saying that you know maybe the role of architecture could become something that actually begins to train our senses to a higher level of uh, um, uh, uh, engage, uh, sort of more complex level of engagement with the world so that we are ultimately able, drawn along by our technology in the future, uh, to uh, uh, process information more efficiently, mm -hmm. to, to interact with the world at a more complex level than we, than we do now. Um, and, and so I'd like to think of the possibilities in those terms where architecture has a role that way. Now, having said that, though, that still leaves open the opportunity for architecture to be exceptional in that case. Uh, in other words, um, the world that architecture is intended to embody, is supposed to embody, is not so narrow that a single, um, uh, a, a single take on it uh, will suffice. So we have minimal stuff now, and we have hyper insanely complex stuff now, and they all the good the good versions of those all kind of do their job in terms of embodying a, a way of being in the world. And so I can imagine that 
Um, uh, you might proceed with your yeah. The other, the other issue is along those lines, um, from a more tectonic perspective, if we are asking the architecture to continue to be legible. I mean, in other words, I'm not, you know, the the the, the creation, the the support or creation of affect is kind of a thing architecture can do, but I don't think it can ever be the whole thing. And so, to a certain extent, for architecture to deserve to to the resources that we put into it, it has to be significant in some way both in terms of important and in terms of legibility. So the question then becomes the, the way in which the, 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 the um, technology of the future in which buildings are woven or spun or, you know, milled or whatever are created is the legibility of that uh, and, and how they are able, let's say, in the tectonic uh, discussion to – uh, make apparent the the actual forces at play in them. You know, the wide flange does a pretty good job of that. Sadly for us, the tube does a better job. Um, but <laughs> this tube does it in a way that you can't know because you don't know that the tube is hollow. Mm -hmm. The wide flange puts the mass out at the periphery where it can do the most work in a way that's visible. And it does it according to a, you know, and it, and it, and it exists within an economic um, uh, infrastructure and, uh, and a structural uh, 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 culture, a culture of economics and structures uh, uh, that is larger than the, than the instance of the individual element. And so it is also able to draw in those kinds of uh, uh, references as well, you know, and so it goes to the whole middle tech uh, argument, the whole American uh, argument as well. And so we find that, that those particular standard steel sections to be uh, most legible, most evocative of the way stuff is happening, the things that they are asked to do. And I just wonder whether the kind of tendrils and, and drippy carbon fiber things uh, are, in a way, they will be uh, – here's another argument, okay? Uh, in a way, you could say that they will be absolutely congruent with the distribution, the most efficient distribution of forces through the material. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point, then I would raise the distinction between an architectural interest and an engineering interest um, in, in that uh, architecture is always going to employ uh, – is always going to involve a level of expression beyond uh, uh, the, the perfectly efficient. And that level of expression will be a distance away from efficiency that will make the, the – whatever it is that's trying to happen – evident or vi visible in a way that a perfect efficiency will make the thing become so completely transparent and invisible to um, to the kind of consideration that we're talking about. As well, yes, they are absolutely as a rhetorical thing as well as holding the building up or you know, doing all the other things that they do. And I think that that's an important, an important distinction. Architecture has a rhetorical responsibility. Would and, there be a new model of reception, though, that might also come with the new models of production? You're, you're, still, you're suggesting there won't be. Uh, well, maybe. But as you acknowledge yeah, Stanford's theory. Yeah, maybe, maybe something argument. will happen with, in the future that I can't yeah. predict or imagine with this Question future human won't be the question. this fu future human evolution, um, but you know it's been we've been kind of like poking along for two million years as meat objects in space, uh, you know, <laughs> doing things you know as 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 Doctor as as Johnson, you know, did I refute it thus you know saying that ultimately <laughs> that that will probably continue to govern. Okay, Wes, thank you so much.